evening. Welcome to the Pennsylvania 166th District House of Representatives Candidates Forum sponsored by the Radnor League of Women Voters. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I'm Gayla McCluskey. I'm part of the voter service team here at the Radnor League of Women Voters and also recently elected to the national board. I will be the moderator for the evening. The League is a nonpartisan political organization, meaning we neither support or oppose candidates. We are dedicated to ensure that, ensuring that all eligible voters have the opportunity and the information to exercise their right to vote. The League en encourages all eligible voters to actively seek it. Everybody silence your cell phones, please. <laughs> we, we encourage everybody to go to our uh, website, vote411.org, where you'll find information on all the candidates. You'll also uh, have information there on voting as well as your polling places. And so we encourage you to go there to be informed and to vote on, on November the 6th. I'd now like to introduce our two candidates that are with us this evening. We have Baltazar Rubio, who's the Republican running for this seat, and Greg Vitale, who's the Democrat incumbent. I'd like to thank Radnor Township for hosting this this evening. It's being uh, televised live, and uh, the tape will be put on YouTube and on the League's website for all to see. The format, <clears throat> excuse me, each candidate will have a two-minute opening statement. Then there will be asked questions from the League, as well as questions from the audience, and each candidate will have one minute to uh, answer those questions. We have three magic cards for each candidate, yellow cards that allow them at any time to extend their comment period for 30 more seconds. I, uh, we have a timekeeper who I'll thank in a minute, but I have my trusty gavel if, if people go over. And we will conclude the evening uh, with two minute closing statements. We expect the forum to run about an hour. I'd like to uh, thank Susan Feldman who uh, coordinated the forum this evening, uh, took care of all the logistics. There are a number of league members that will be handing out index cards to which you can write your questions. They will be screened by not just one, but three presidents of our local leagues. We have Roberta Winters from Radnor, Lauren Costa from Laura Marion, and Kathy Youngman from Haverford. And we appreciate their help. I do want to remind everybody that the questions have to be directed to both candidates. Obviously, um, we will not ask any off-color questions, and so that's, that's one reason why we do the screening. And I would be remiss not to thank Megan Gummel, who is going to be our timekeeper. And with that, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to get ready, but um, Mr. Rubio, are you ready to, and to give us your opening statement? Hello, I'm Balthazar Rubio, father of two toddlers, a first-generation American of Latino descent, a career public defender, and a very concerned citizen. I'm concerned because our present representative is a career politician who showed us his true nature this election season, when he ran for Congress while being accused by his own party of misrepresenting the truth about his dual run for Congress and this seat. It feels he took us for granted. I do not believe that Greg Vitale has represented our district in a meaningful way since he took office in 93. He hasn't authored to passage legislation since his first years in office, to my knowledge. His party's lost faith with him in the 166th, and we suffer as a district. He's been stripped of all his leadership positions by his own party. His 25 years in office has not earned us the benefit of his seniority. Greg Vitale's job performance is avoidable, and it's a bipartisan problem. I believe 
we need to remove lifetime politicians that do not produce positive results for our district. That is a result of gerrymandering, political partisanship, voter apathy, and plain old lack of transparency. I believe if the voters knew what they were getting for their money, they would be angry. We need to increase transparency for that reason. Now, my campaign began in February of this year, and I thought that it would be driven by a thorough discussion of the issues that affect the constituents of the 166. Unfortunately, my criticism of Mr. Vitale, through his votes, has drawn hate mail and anger, which is par for the current political course that we're on. And I find that we need to do something to lower the temperature of our political discussion. I would suggest that people look to more independent-minded politicians and people who are more moderate. And I would suggest that I am that type of person to represent the 166th. Mr. Vitale. Well, I'm glad we're going to keep things positive tonight. Um, thank you, uh, League, for putting this on. You guys always do a great job. Thank you to the audience for your uh, being here tonight, showing your interest in good government. Thank you to the uh, uh, citizens of the 166th District. It's been an honor serving you, and thank you for the trust um, you place in me. I am a lifetime 62-year-old uh, resident of this district. I think my values reflect this district. Uh, I am a strong supporter of brick-and-mortar public schools because I understand they are the bedrock of this this community and, and our good schools are why our property values are so high and our children are so successful. Um, I have a lifetime record of, of near if not 100 percent on gun control issues, sensible gun policies, which uh, the importance of which is underscored by the tragedy in Pittsburgh this weekend. I am a firm supporter of reproductive rights for women, which I think is the prevailing view in this district. My focus has been on environmental protection, and I will uh, continue uh, to do that. Climate change is the most important long-term threat to this planet, and um, I am committed towards working towards that. Uh, locally, my district office has helped countless people. We have a reputation for doing a great job because we hire good people and we give them the proper guidance. Uh, my constituents know who I am because I keep them informed. I visit every home and I talk individually to people. We send them quarterly newsletters. We do a monthly cable show. We do uh, numerous email blasts a week that let people know that I'm thinking of them, I'm keeping them informed, and um, I hope to continue representing this district because I think it's a great district with great people. Thank you both. And now we'll proceed uh, with some questions, and we'll start with you, Mr. Vitale. In your view, how does Pennsylvania rank as a place to work and do business? What specific plans do you have for bringing better paying jobs to your district? I think, um, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question, considering we are about at the lowest unemployment rate in, this, in, in, in quite a long time. Um, I think that, um, you know, as an economics major, I have some appreciation of the district. I think we talked about the value of good public schools as, as a, helping the community. Uh, we, um, with regard to infrastructure, also very important. We pass some very key legislation uh, that really funded both public public transportation and, and mass transportation that's, and, and uh, roads and bridges, and that's why you see so much construction uh, in this community. Um, I think education, infrastructure, all these things are very important in really um, creating the community we have, and, and that's why things, frankly, uh, are very good right now. Thank you. Mr. Rubio? Thank you for the question. Um, my focus has been on small business development and generation. I myself am a small businessman. Aside from being a public defender, I have a small law practice um, that I work. It's a boutique practice, but my wife's also a small businesswoman, so was my father. Uh, if you look down Darby, if you look in Ardmore, if you look around the community, what you see are a lot of converted houses. You see a lot of small businesses. We have brand new uh, shops that are setting up inside of these small businesses, we have to figure out a way through 
tax, uh, uh, through taxes and working with taxes, possibly even lowering the PIT to encourage small businesses to grow. My concern has never been mega business, and this is not the community for that. We have just a few box stores, a few large uh, businesses here. However, uh, specifically in Haverford Township, there's not uh, this focus on uh, mega business generation. I have no interest in focusing on large corporate tax breaks or corporate welfare that's actually damaging uh, Pennsylvania and is damaging to our district. Thank you. The next question will begin with Mr. Rubio. Many voters say that access to quality health care is a top issue for them in this election. What specific steps would you take to increase and streamline access to health care in Pennsylvania? That's a fantastic question. Um, let me begin by saying that I am a walking, talking, pre-existing condition. Uh, I suffered a motorcycle accident in 2012 that took off my left leg, nearly took off the arm, uh, 17 days after my wedding. And but for the grace of God and Delaware County's health care plan, I was brought back to the person you see here today. Uh, we need to make sure, and I would work to ensure that the type of health care that I received is accessible to all the residents. Now, we have a mix of private plans and Medicaid. We should not even begin considering cuts in Medicaid or qualifications to Medicaid. Impediments to things like Medicaid would damage the least among us, and that's anti-progressive. It's just wrong for our district. So all my focus would be on, and every thought that I would have about it would concern trying to get the same health care that helped me survive to everybody else. Thank you, Mr. Vitale. Yeah, I, I support accessible, affordable health care for all. I, I view it per, uh, predominantly as a federal rather than a state issue. It's, it's not a, uh, an issue that we have legislated on uh, uh, in, the, in the past number of years. Uh, I support generally um, strengthening the Affordable Care Act uh, and uh, ultimately uh, su support a, a Medicare for all type uh, federal health policy. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. We'll start with Mr. Vitale. Pennsylvania schools continue to be challenged with increasing class sizes and increasing costs. What do you view are the top program problems sorry, with public education, and what are your proposals to improve it? One problem we have is the state is not meeting its responsibility to fund basic education. We're probably only giving about 36.8 percent of the total monies for uh, basic education. We really, um, if we are responsible, we would increase that to about 50 percent. Uh, that would drive money into school districts. It would take uh, pressure off of uh, local school taxpayers, senior, senior citizens, and so forth. Um, another th issue we've just dealt with relating to that in Harrisburg is high school graduation requirements, the high stakes testing. We just passed legislation that really responded to the complaints of citizens and pushed that back and made other avenues accessible to, uh, uh, in, instead of these, the, these, um, these high stakes tests. Mr. Rubio. Thank you. Um, as many of you actually already know, I spent several years on the Chester Upland School Board. Uh, an issue that's near and dear to my heart would be completing the fair funding formula, and there have been positive votes on that. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't have a school board like I had to deal with in 2011 that had to sue Governor Corbett. We went there because the funding formula, the sourcing, I mean, we're a very wealthy state and we need to make sure that it is equitable for all the citizens. The 166 has some of the best schools in the district, the best school in Delaware County, um, but they always need improvements. So uh, we have to make sure that the funding sources that come out of Harrisburg uh, would work to our benefit, but also be very fairly distributed throughout the state. So 
we begin with the fair funding formula, but then move on from there and have a little bit more progressive view of how we have to deal with the least among us and those school districts that are reflected that way. Thank you, and we'll start with you, Mr. Rubio. What is your opinion of, is that a fire alarm? Yeah. Okay, excuse me, I'll start over. What is your opinion of Pennsylvania's current process for redistricting? Would you be supportive of an independent commission to redraw the voting district boundaries? If not, what would alternatives would you propose? Answer to your question quickly is yes. Very much yes. Absolutely yes, 100%. The 166th is a gerrymandered district. Um, we have to battle back against lifetime politicians. Nobody is entitled to a job for life unless they're uh, entitled to a federal court uh, position. We should not allow for that to happen. And the Citizens Commission is very important because when I looked at the way that they uh, created the composition of it, it's 443, you know, and when you look at the Citizens Commission, they will go ahead and strip right through the politics. We should not let the fox rule the hen house and decide when and where, uh, when and how to open the door. This doesn't make any sense because when we look at what happens around Pennsylvania and in the Congress, we have lifetime politicians that don't care whether or not politics is nasty or getting more caustic. Um, I'll use my card on this one. Because the current political climate is, has a lot to do with, you know, very entrenched positions from the politicians who can speak any way they want and know that they'll get reelected, put forward any bill they like and they know they're going to get reelected. And now we're in a position where we're fighting for the republic's life and we've seen political violence now, which has only been matched by, uh, the last time we saw something like this was in the 60s with the weathermen. Political bombings? You know, these attempted assassinations, the shootings at, 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 at ball fields of congressmen. This is due to things like gerrymandering, safe districts, and out-of-control politicians. Thanks, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Vitale. I'm a co-sponsor of House Bill 722, the Samuelson Bill, which creates uh, an independent commission for redistricting. And I guess the... Uh, poster child for the need for that was our own uh, former 7th Congressional District, which uh, was just an abomination. It took uh, the court to step in to change that, but that's only a one-time solution. That issue reappears with the next redistricting. So um, I am a, a firm believer of, um, of, of an independent redistricting commission. I'm a co-sponsor, and I'll continue to um, work on that issue. Thank you, and we'll start with you, um, Mr. Vitale. What is your primary motivation for public service? You know, I, m many years ago, uh, when I was a much younger man, the, the township adopted a recycling policy in response to a state law that was passed, which I felt was taking the easy way out, so I set up a card table and began gathering signatures as a community activist and was able to uh, improve the township's recycling program. Uh, I took that uh, to helping out getting a ha household hazardous waste collection program in the county and uh, took that environmental activism now to Harrisburg. My, my life mission is environmental protection. I get up in the morning and think the focus of my day, how I structure it depends on what I can do to help the environment. I, I am a, a focused on that issue and that's what drives me and that's what keeps me wanting to do this job because, and I'll just uh, take a card, there are, um, this is a fossil fuel state. And it's really tough doing environmental policy in a fossil fuel state, but it's so needed because we produce a full 1% of the world's greenhouse gas in Pennsylvania. And there are not legislators in Harrisburg who will simply take the time, get into the weeds, use their political capital on this most important issue. I've done that. I have the commitment to continue to do that. That's what drives me. Thank you, Mr. Rubio. October of 2010, I was working in criminal court, 
public defender's office, I had a gentleman who was on multiple violations of probation, and he came to me begging me for more help with his heroin addiction. And I went to my judge, we discussed it, my judge threw him away for two years, like that, done. The way that we view opioids and people who suffer from addiction is almost inhumane. And it's the reason why I grew into my public defender service. It's the reason why I spend so much time fighting for my clients. And it, it angered me that my judge would do that to this gentleman. And I it fully expressed how many times he tried. But what I realized was that we as a community had failed him. We as a community did not offer enough um, treatment to him. And I was talking to the wife for two weeks, complaining to her that somebody should do something. And she reminded me that I should be the one. Thank you. And moving on to the next question, uh, we'll start with Mr. Rubio. What is the biggest unfunded or underfunded infrastructure requirement you see for Pennsylvania in the next five years? How would you pay for it? What taxes or fees would you increase? What other spending would you reduce? Internet development. Wireless, uh, wireless broadcasting and free Wi-Fi is one of the largest, um, you know, unfunded, underfunded problems. And it's an infrastructural development. Uh, I was reading some reports about uh, the country. We are relying too much on our cell phones for wireless communications. And here's the reason why it's important. Because as we transition into the 21st century, we're going to be dealing a lot with small businesses, home production businesses, and our pipelines for uh, you know, moving products has been revolutionized by Amazon. So when we're living in a post-Amazon 21st century with a lot of small business people, we have to make sure that they're able to access their marketplace. And increasingly, that marketplace is the internet. Uh, we have a lot of inter uh, internet dead zones uh, all over the state, primarily in the center of the state, but we need to access uh, or create the access to free Wi-Fi for people who want to get their small business off the ground, and I think this is another way to help that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vitale? I, I, cer certainly, if you believe the overwhelming majority of uh, climate scientists and, and what came out of the Paris uh, agreements, uh, we need to be carbon neutral by mid-century to avoid the worst effects of climate change. And that involves uh, moving away from fossil fuel infrastructure, things like uh, pipelines and uh, coal-fired power plants and so forth, to um, carbon-free infrastructure, more solar, more wind, uh, various charging stations and, and, and so forth. So I think we need a massive um, reshaping of the infrastructure of our, 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 our economy to deal with this very pressing reality of, of, of um, climate change. Thank you. And we'll start uh, the next question with uh, Mr. Vitale. Gun violence has become too commonplace in our nation as well as our state. What are your suggestions to end gun violence? How would you protect our children from gun violence in schools? I have uh, co-sponsored an, uh, an assault of weapons ban. I've co-sponsored legislation with regard to lost and stolen guns. I've co-sponsored legislation with regard to banning bump stocks, uh, those, those devices that cause quickly repeating firing. I've uh, co-sponsored legislation with regard to banning high power, power magazines. Uh, recently, we had a success on this issue in Harrisburg by actually passing legislation which the governor signed a rare gun win, which would take away guns from those domestic abusers who either have um, had a final protection from abuse order uh, issued against them or have been convicted of a crime relating to domestic abuse. So that was one uh, very uh, small win we had, but uh, there are many things we can do. We just need the people up there to do it. Thank you, Mr. Rubio. Thank you. Um, he's referring to House Bill 2060, I believe. Um, 
the PFA law. Now, that is a fantastic beginning incremental step in what has to be constructed as good common sense gun legislation. When you take a look at what guns really are, when you consider the responsibility that goes with owning firearms, you have to keep in mind that first and foremost, we have to make sure that we focus on keeping them away from individuals who should not otherwise possess them or who have done something to disqualify themselves. The PFA Bill 2060, fantastic start. It acknowledges the fact that we will remove guns from people who have proven themselves to be dangerous in domestic violence cases. We have other uh, issues we need to look at, uh, universal background checks, the uh, HB 1400 background checks at gun shows. These things are important uh, steps to a common, common sense gun legislation package that we need to enact. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll start the next question with Mr. Rubio. The league supports protecting the rights of all voters, citizens to vote, and encourages them to do so. What three things would you do to break down the barriers to voting to increase voter participation? Sorry. Well, we don't have the ID law, which is, which is good. I see voting uh, as a constitutional franchise, and it's incredibly important. It's the most important thing anyone in this republic can do. We have to take that very seriously. I was talking to somebody about this uh, a few weeks ago, and we had a discussion as to how people have lost that franchise. And I've known this for years working in the criminal justice arena, and it bothers me to this day that we're actually removing people's rights to votes for any reason. So we need to start investigating uh, more efficient ways to return people's rights to vote who have lost them or ceded them in some fashion. Uh, we need to make sure that there's not an ID law, nothing that looks like that. It's unnecessary to my mind. Um, what we really need to focus on is not who's voting or who we don't want to vote, but the messages we're sending out to people to come out and vote for us, come out and vote for me, come out and vote for anyone. We have to make sure that our messaging is more important than any restriction on voting. Thank you, Mr. Vitale. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, taught a course at Villanova on, on state and local government, and we covered this topic. And one of the states we, we uh, talked about was Washington State, which actually uh, votes by mail. And uh, not only did that increase voter participation rates, but it also, uh, there was no fraud uh, detected in that state, and uh, also it was, it was much cheaper to uh, administer elections. I mean, that's certainly a, a far-reaching proposal, but something that maybe the state should consider. But other, other things that the League have suggested, things like um, you know, same-day voter registration, uh, things along those lines, anything that makes it um, easier to vote, uh, you know, just uh, having voter rolls not purged as quickly, things along those lines, anything that makes it easier uh, for people to, to vote uh, uh, should be strongly considered. Thank you, and we'll begin uh, with Mr. Vitale. How will you work with the Board of Commissioners in Haverford and Radnor? How, how will I? Yeah, uh, you know, my, my doors my doors always open. Kevin McCloskey's here. We we talk a lot. I have uh, I have a good relationship with uh, uh, the boards of both uh, Lower Marion, uh, Radnor, Haverford. Uh, they know that um, you know, they can they can always call me. Uh, I'm asked time to time. We recently had a meeting on uh, the problem we had with the paving on Eagle Road, uh, which I thought went very well and got the desired uh, result we wanted. Um, but uh, my door is um, always open to commissioners, uh, always supportive uh, when uh, there's a grant or a state grant request, which uh, um, you know they want my backing on. So, so um, I have a, a, a good relationship with the board, and uh, you know my my door is always open. Thank you, Mr. Rubio. Do the same thing I do every day in court. I'd go to them. I would go to them. Um, I see all the boards of commissioners, I see other elected officials, township officials, as just another line of outreach to the community. They are, in a way, even more grassroots. So 
being there with them and talking to them and finding out their concerns, you know, should structure the way that I would approach my job in Harrisburg. I think every representative should do this. I think they should be there uh, culling as much information from those folks that are out there in the second ward, the third ward, seventh ward, and Radnor's seventh, out there really connecting to the voters on a daily basis, even more so than I could uh, when in Harrisburg. So I would use them to set the agenda that I would take to Harrisburg. If there are needs, like I was talking to one of the commissioners here at Radnor, there's a, oh, 10 seconds, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's an underpass that's continually getting struck by a truck and no one's listening. This is something that needs to be taken care of. I've heard the cost valuations on it. Let me just run off on Rich's thing for a minute. Uh, the cost valuation on this was in the tens of millions, and we stood there for 30 minutes, and, and Commissioner Booker was telling me all about it, you know, and, and I came up with a few ideas just off the top of my head, like what, we, uh, what I did when I was in the, the city of Chester. Uh, we have to redirect the truck traffic, you know, and, and I told him, I said, well, how about we start talking to Garmin, we start talking to all the uh, app makers that have any directional apps, we can go ahead and stop getting your bridge hit by redirecting them on their tom-toms and their garments and in their cars. It's things like that that make this job worth doing, but also helps make me a more effective representative. Thank you. We'll begin with Mr. Rubio. Domestic violence is, violence is an issue that impacts families and communities. How do you believe the legislature can best address this issue and support those who are both victims and dependents in these unfortunate circumstances? Now that is a question. Um, that's that's very important. We, as a government entity, are cautious not to get into people's homes. However, when you do something that invokes the police action, um, then uh, we need to take a very serious stand uh, against that violence. Now, I've dealt with domestic violence for over a decade as a defense attorney. I see it. Um, I'm proud to see what our representatives are doing about removing guns uh, in domestic violence situations. Uh, I know exactly how the PFA laws work there, but we can strengthen those. Um, we can make sure that we give more resourcing to the judges at the county levels to hear, uh, to have longer hearings, to have more in-depth hearings, uh, give more resources and community and social work resources uh, to the families affected. We don't have a social work interaction and you would be surprised to know that in PFA courts, there's no social work interaction uh, in violent situations. So, uh, and this, this is a problem across the board, uh, I see in public defense. We're not funding these concerns nearly enough. And this is, this is directly a resource uh, uh, issue from Harrisburg. It's just a funding source problem. I've seen it for 13 years as a defense attorney, 10 years as a public defender, and I would absolutely go to Harrisburg to help resource this issue better and I think we need to throw a lot of social work at it to, just to begin with. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vitale. Yeah, no, in, in a former lifetime, I also uh, did domestic uh, relations work, did deal with uh, protection from abuse orders, uh, did deal with these very uh, uh, difficult uh, situations, and uh, understand what one, women go through when they're in these situations. And I do agree that uh, more resources need to be devoted towards them. I, again, not to repeat myself, but I'm very happy we did have that uh, very rare, rare gun win in requiring guns being t taken away from people who've had a uh, final protection from abuse order lodged against them. Not only were their guns taken away, but they were put uh, away from you know other family members who who. Um, may in fact uh, give them give them back they were put in a a uh, they were required to be given to attorneys or police authorities uh, so um, yeah very supportive of this issue thank you and we'll begin the next question um, with mr. Vitale do you support or oppose increasing Pennsylvania's minimum wage and why I support it uh, our current Okay, look at you, not you, I get it, I'm sorry. Um, our current minimum wage is uh, $7.25 an hour, uh, as is the federal uh, minimum wage. It's been at that level since uh, uh, 2009, I think. Uh, it is 
time to increase it. Uh, I don't have an exact figure as to what that should be. I'm not going to buy into the talking point, just $15 an hour and, and, and forget it, because there are adverse consequences. There are certain subgroups who are advantaged by that. I mean, uh, you know, the problem is when you increase the minimum wage, you know, you, some employers will choose to uh, automate more. Some employers will choose to uh, reduce hours of people, which ha which hurts poor people. Some 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 employers will uh, outsource jobs to another country. Um, you know, teenagers are particularly hard hit by that because they're, they're the people who, who 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 get the minimum wage. So, it's a difficult problem. But I do generally support increasing the minimum wage. Thank you, Mr. Rubio. Thank you. The the national trends towards fifteen. Um, and we do, as uh, Mr. Vitale pointed out, and as CNN's pointing out, as the news is always pointing out, the economy's booming. Uh, unemployment is at a historic low for some communities. But if we artificially increase the minimum wage, we're going to end up causing problems for small businesses. What we need to do first, before we just make an arbitrary decision on this matter, is talk to small business leaders. Talk to the SBA. Uh, I've been endorsed by CPAC. For, this very, for these types of reasons. Um, when we take a look at these issues, we need to take into account first the stakeholders. We have to talk to them directly. Now, increasing to $15 wouldn't matter to Pfizer or wouldn't matter to you know, uh, the big multinationals. These billionaire companies could do it tomorrow if they wanted to. However, you know, the people most affected are gonna be the small business people. Like I said, I, I pointed out Ardmore, Darby Road, all right, when you take a look at the businesses on Manoa and Route 3, if you go to Nuss Printing, if you go down there to Brick and Brew, ask them if they can afford it. And whatever their answer is, that's how it should drive the debate. Thank you. And we'll uh, begin with Mr. Rubio for the next question. Are you satisfied with the size of the state legislature? If not, how would you like to see it changed? This goes back to my opening argument, goes back a few questions. Um, we have to figure out a way to uh, govern correctly. And in order to do that, we have to stand against career and lifetime politicians. This is not a right to do this job. There's nothing about this job that dictates that I or anyone should be here for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. You take a look at the uh, people in the U.S. Senate, a lot of them are there to the point, like I said before, that they don't care how what they do affects all of us. So um, I'm absolutely for taking a look at how we perhaps even reduce the size of the legislature. We're one of the highest paid, this is one of the highest paid legislatures in the country, all right? $90,000 a year to do this job, all right? And like I said before, and in the opening remarks, you gotta ask what you're getting for your money. As a business prospect, you've got to know and, and, and make sure that they're accountable. And perhaps shrinking the size of the legislature could accomplish, uh, could accomplish that goal of you know, good government. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Vitale. Uh, I've opposed House Bill 153, which would have shrunk the size of the legislature to its current uh, 203 to 153 legislators. In interestingly enough, that bill was also opposed by the League of Women Voters. It was opposed by Common Cause of Pennsylvania. It was also uh, opposed by the Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau opposed it, interestingly enough, because in rural areas uh, where a 60,000 uh, person district, it now stretches 80 miles across. If you increase the size, if you decrease the size of, 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 of the legislature, you're increasing the population, and that, that gets to even a more unmanageable size. The beauty, the, the problem with in, uh, decreasing the number of legislators is you increase the number of people we represent. You can no longer, uh, you can no longer win a, a, this job on shoe leather. You become more dependent upon special interest groups. There's a value to representing a smaller number of people. There's more intimacy, there's more chance you're gonna uh, be able to just chat with people, go to their events and so forth. Um, so I think that there's, there's sort of a, um, it's a very populist idea, but it has unintended consequences. And that's why groups who've given us some thought um, oppose that. 
Thank you. And we'll start the next question with Mr. Vitale. What are your strategies for protecting marginalized communities in Pennsylvania from housing, lending, employment, and other discrimination? We don't really have any strategies, frankly, but I do think it's very important um, that we have good schools. It's very, and I, even though, you know, it's, especially early on when the district had a slightly different character and it was not the most popular thing in the world to support funding for uh, Chester Upland and Philadelphia, I did because, because it's so important. It's so important to give kids an education. You can say what you want uh, about adults, but every kid, every kid ought to have an education where he has the opportunity to actualize his potential. So I would say things like supporting pre-K, supporting basic public, public schools, supporting you know uh, programs that, that give these kids uh, meals so they start off the day with a good breakfast, things like that. You're not, you, you can't waste money when you're invest, investing in poor kids and their education. You just can't waste money. Yes, Mr. Rubio. There was some civil lawsuits that I dealt with, um, the fallout from, uh, uh, about reverse redlining. I think your question points in that direction. 10, 15 years ago, a few credit card companies were accused of, of uh, you know, taking uh, advantage of poor communities. And since Chester, when I was working there, I had some credit card cases and I saw the effects of reverse redlining. And this is the type of thing that you're talking about. We need to take a stance with credit and lending institutions that they are not to take advantage of these communities. As they begin to transition, uh, as Chester has started to transition, Upper Darby started to transition, as these communities, uh, West and North Philly, start to transition upwards economically, uh, we do see that lending institutions are going in there. Now, my experience with the reverse redlining was that uh, I come to, came to find out in Philadelphia and in Delaware County that when they go and extend these credit cards, they just abuse these people with fees and interest in the lawsuit that follows these credit situations. So we need to take a more serious look and stance against those type of practices. Thank you. Um, and we'll start with Mr. Rubio. What are your suggestions for increasing state revenue to finance the programs you want to implement? Shale tax. Shale tax, we should have voted on that one. It was on the floor, it was voted down. Um, some in this room voted against it. It didn't make sense to me then. Um, we need to increase our tax base uh, by creating other businesses and creating other avenues and revenue streams. Now, we do have um, some very good revenue streams here and some available. Uh, marijuana is becoming actually an available revenue stream. The, the possibility that that could increase uh, is basically increasing a tax base. Now, none of this will then increase the income tax for all of you citizens, because when it comes right down to it, you're the ones that keep us in this job or not. And if I was to go out there and increase all of your taxes, you'd have a real serious problem with me. So we have to be creative about finding our funding sources. And then when we have one that is readily available, we need to act proactively to capitalize on that source. Thank you, Mr. Vitale. I mean, not only was I the first legislator to introduce a shale tax bill, but I was told, uh, reminded by a reporter that when then Governor Wolf was Revenue Secretary Wolf, I actually introduced the concept in Pennsylvania as an economics major, uh, it made perfect sense to me. And I brought it up when Governor Rendell uh, was governor. So I'm fully supportive of a shale tax. And, uh, uh, but, but frankly, uh, if you look logically at our tax sources, the PIT, if you increase the PIT maybe a half of a percent, right now it's about 3.07, that is, that is a very strong revenue source, you could, you could really fund education and really reduce and use that money to really uh, help communities lower, lower their school taxes. So I, I, we, we need to think about that if we really want to get beyond rhetoric and really talk about uh, realistic revenue sources. 
Thank you. And we'll begin with uh, Mr. Rubio on the next question. What do you view as the worst of our existing state-funded programs, and sh should it be eliminated or modified? That's a tough one. The, the list has to be evaluated. Um, we really need to go from top down. Now, as I'm not in Harrisburg, I don't have access to the overall budget itemized and to really see how these things work. I can look at it on the internet and I can guess at the things that I don't like, but the one thing that I don't have is experience in the understanding of each individual community's budget. So when we start talking about what we're going to cut, it, it cannot be something that we just decide, well, you know, this, this is a bad idea, or the, conceptually or, or, or even philosophically these things are bad ideas. We have to take a look at when we trim the budget, where it's going to have the most impact, and how. Um, there's been a lot of discussion federally about doing things like trimming Medicare. This is an example of a not good idea. Uh, this is an example of you know, people who have been in office too long making pronouncements that will not affect them because they won't get voted out of office for doing it. So when you consider trimming budgets, you have to consider the impact on the individual community that it will have. Actually, you know, we are frankly underfunded right now. I think our state budget is underfunded. We, we uh, underfund education. We underfund environmental protection. Uh, we are not we are not properly doing our, our job funding what, what we should be doing uh, right now. We're, we're using sort of smoke and mirrors to keep things going. We're funding uh, what we need to be doing on things like uh, expanding gambling. We just put gambling uh, on the internet, which is a terrible idea. We're selling off um, uh, state assets. We are, we are borrowing. So I don't think, I think, I think if you want to really do what this state needs to be doing as far as helping its citizens and protecting uh, the Commonwealth, you need, to, you need to actually fund state government properly. You need, to state, you need to fund state government at a higher level. Thank you. And uh, we'll start with Mr. Vitale. What are your top three environmental priorities for 2019 to 20 session of the General Assembly? How will achieving these priorities improve Pennsylvania's environment and benefit the residents and, and businesses in our district? The, um, I, I, think, I think the top doable goal with regard to the environment is methane regulations. Governor Wolf promised methane regulations in uh, uh, 2016, still has not delivered with regard to uh, existing sources. Uh, I'm, I'm tracking uh, the, the development of regulations, which he said is going to come out in 2019, but I think that's something realistic we can do to really, um, you know, combat climate change. Properly funding the Department of Environmental Protection is 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 crucial to what we do. We 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 lost we've lost uh, probably uh, um, we we're down from about three thousand employees to uh, twenty six hundred employees uh, uh, in about the past decade. You talk an anecdotally to these the workers for the DEP, they are cut beyond the bone. I think that would be uh, step two. Thank you, Mr. Rubio. Thank you. Um, there's two ways to look at this. Now, we look at the global effect of carbon. So we've got to investigate uh, or consider instituting carbon tax. Great. But the 166 suffers from other more local and serious problems that have been ignored by the legislature. Uh, drive down Route 3, you're going to get to a bottleneck. And you go Darby Road, you're going to get to a bottleneck. Come around in many of our communities, you're going to get to bottlenecks. We got uh, an F rating by the American Lung Association two years ago, I believe it was, the study that I saw. It was because we have smog. It's not something that's really big and, 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 and a sexy issue, but it's an issue that affects my children. It is an issue that affects your children on a daily basis. And we haven't done anything from the state to even institute a traffic, stu a traffic study in decades to go ahead and start moving the traffic through faster. Um, it's great to talk about the global environment on this. However, in you know, our local environment, we have to deal with smog. And I was going to say solar panels, but I got stopped. Uh, 
Um, we'll start with uh, Mr. Rubio for the next question. Polls show that people of both parties believe that we need to, um, to have campaign finance reform. If elected, what will you do to rein in big money in politics at the state level? Fantastic question from a very small campaign with a very small budget. Uh, absolutely. Transparency is the key to begin with. Campaign finance reform is a problem. We have to legislate away Citizens United. This is a cancer. This bill is terrible. It is also increasing political hate. If we allow uh, big corporate PAC money to go ahead and write commercials that uh, say horrible things like what that robocall down in Florida against Gilliam, all right? These are the type of things that we need to legislate against, getting rid of those PAC money, getting somehow reversing the Citizens United decision through local legislation that will cause a transparency and reverse the affect of big party money. This campaign, my campaign, is being run by donors right like in this room, all individuals, small money donors, and that's who I've gone to. I don't have huge packs behind me, and I didn't even ask for them, didn't run after them, all right? And the reason was because I wanted this thing funded by us, for us. Thank you, Mr. Vitale. Um, yeah, many years ago, I actually was successful in getting a campaign finance bill passed in the House. It was the Gubernatorial Public Financing Act, which was uh, modeled after New Jersey's very successful um, uh, current law. Uh, it, it died in the Senate, regrettably. Um, I also, uh, because I thought we should have had a searchable database for campaign contributions, and we didn't, I actually uh, did my own, put my own up until, and kind of shamed, I believe it was the Ridge administration, into doing it themselves, because if I could do it as a lowly backbench legislator, they could too. Um, I think that uh, one of the low-hanging fruit here is, you know, even though the Department of State does have a searchable database, which which allows reporters and other watchers of government to look at look at uh, these reports, it needs to be vastly improved. And I think that's something doable that the that the Wolf administration can do. Thank you, and we'll begin now with Mr. Vitale. What are your ideas for balancing development and economic growth while preserving open space? I don't, I don't think they're uh, mutually exclusive um, at all. Um, I've always um, supported uh, you know, our, our growing greener programs and other things that fund preservation of open space. Um, <clears throat> I've been supportive of legislation uh, that would uh, preserve and expand uh, stream buffers, uh, which um, uh, uh, are essential to um, stream health. Um, you know, I've I've have a, um, a probably a lifetime record of 100% uh, with regard to uh, environmental issues and. Uh, um, again, I just don't think the two issues of economic development and preserving open space are uh, mutually exclusive. Thank you, Mr. Rubio. You may be surprised to hear me say I agree with that. Um, I, I think he's right on that point. Uh, I think that when we allow a business to zone in, we have to, at the local level, and Radner's is good at doing this, I've observed, uh, make sure that they do preserve open space. We have to make sure that impenetrable uh, space, you know, parking lots, so on and so forth, is kept to the, min the minimum nece uh, necessary to achieve the needs of the business. So it becomes a zoning type of issue there. The state could help that, um, you know, with crediting and with uh, business development that would help these folks go into an area and not just ruin it with parking lots. You know, we have to keep that little bit of open space for our children. We have to keep it for our community, and it's important, especially since I moved into Haverford Township and there's uh, a bit of a paucity on open space. You know, I, I really love my local parks, and I keep finding new ones, but before we allowed the zoning to go into the, the, the way that it has, as far as the, the community is concerned, they maybe should have done a little more to preserve it. Thank you, and we'll begin with um, Mr. Rubio on this question. The 
166 has a complicated relationship with Philadelphia. How would you describe that re relationship and are there changes you would like to make? Philadelphia is a bit of an interesting situation with dark money creep. Uh, I've been looking at this and have been studying the problem recently. They are looking to take over. And the current 5th Congressional will give them the ability to dictate terms in the Congressional District to Delaware County. We have to not necessarily resist so much as stand our ground on legal issues. We need representatives that will go there and make sure that the laws, to go to Harrisburg and make sure that the laws don't uh, unnaturally or unnecessarily favor Philadelphia's growth. Because Delaware County was doing fine before, you know, before Philly, Philly dug itself out of its hole in the 80s and the 90s, all right? We were doing fine back then. Boeing is still good. And we need to go ahead and concentrate on developing our own businesses in Delaware County and very safely and securely doing it while resisting Philly creep, Philly dark money, and Philadelphia influence, especially because the district is now or could potentially be a Philadelphia-controlled district. Thank you. And Mr. Vitale? Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it complicated. I'll, t I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, when I was in, in, in high school, I was on the same high school football team as both uh, Mayor Nutter and, and Mayor Kenny. So we get along, we get along very well. And, uh, and, you know, it's interesting when I knock on doors, I will talk to Haverford Township and Radnor Township residents who actually teach in Philadelphia, they have a very vested interest in 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 wanting you know the, the schools to survive. I mean, we 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 our health and Philadelphia's health we we rise and fall together. So I I, I think we 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 need to act as 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 partners. And uh, I think it's 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 you know I root for Philly. I I, I vote for Philly's. Uh, economic health. I vote for mass transit for Philly because, um, you know, we all, we all do better when Philadelphia is a great city and we enjoy its benefits. Yeah. Thank you. And um, as we promised the candidates, we would go about an hour. And so we're ready for our closing statements. We'll start with Mr. Vitale. We'll give you the opportunity to prepare and start when you're ready. Okay, can I take like 15 minutes and prepare? Because <laughs> I haven't done that yet. <laughs> Be right back. Uh, no, I'm, you know, listen, uh, again, thanks to the league. You guys do a great job. I always participate in your debates because it's, it's an obligation and, and a privilege to, to, to do it. And, and thank you for your interest in state government. Thanks to the audience uh, at, at home who are watching. And, and thanks to the residents. Uh, this job has been the honor of my lifetime, and um, I, I do not take it for granted after 26 years. I am out in the, uh, I was out this weekend, I'm, and I'll be out on November 7th visiting people. I don't take this job uh, for granted at all. I have a very defined role in Harrisburg. I'm viewed as a very serious legislator. I'm, I'm, I'm viewed as someone who reads bills, who catches things in legislation, who's active in floor debate, who, ca who catches things that other legislators don't, and who speaks out for things that other legislators don't. I speak truth to power, and that gets me in trouble sometimes. I'll, I'll, if, I'll, if, if, if the governor is, is doing something that harms the environment, I'll, I'll call him on it. If my own leadership wants to pass a set of House rules that's going to uh, give you less access, access I'll call him on it, and I'll, I'll challenge him on the House floor. Frankly, that's what costs me my uh, environmental job. And uh, I will vote, and I do vote, based on good public policy. I don't defensively legislate. And that's why you see all this stuff in this campaign literature. Other legislators vote for it because they're covering their backside, but they know it's not good public policy, but they know they'll lose the soundbite war just like we have these sound bites going against me. So what I bring to this process is I, I, I work hard, I vote on public policy, I, I will challenge people when they're not doing the right thing, and if you reelect me, people, I will continue to do the same thing. Thank you very much, Mr. Rubio. Thank you. I want to thank the League for having me. I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak here and on Radnor TV.
speak to the voters. This is, you know, I've been doing this since February, knocking on doors, onesies and twosies, and since we're a small campaign and not super funded by PACs, it's been very manual. Uh, but this is a good vehicle to get out there and talk to the voters. Um, with everything that's been said, I would suggest that you haven't seen a Republican candidate like me probably ever. Uh, Latino candidate standing here espousing moderate beliefs completely uh, because in this day and age, you know, as I've been accused, we're doing soundbite campaigns and anger campaigns. We have to get beyond that. But here's the thing. When I exposed these bad votes and all legislators run on their votes, you have to look at what they do and what they say. For 25 years, we've been getting votes against things like Zachary's Law, tender year protections this year um, for children with autism, tender years protection extension to human trafficking and incest. All of these matters have been voted against by my opponent, and you must take that into consideration because we have to know the community we live in. This is a bedroom community of families. This is not North Philly or West Philly. This is not an up and coming community. This is not an industrial town. This is a town that's based on families and schools. And we have to vote for that primarily. And when we have votes against Zachary's Law and votes against the SB 261, we're voting against our community. And when I made that aware, I got hate mail on Facebook. I got phone calls where people were calling me up very angrily, telling me what they thought about my infographics, and I even posted something up about that. But the truth of it is, if you're angry with the infographics, you're angry with the content. I didn't generate that content. The person who voted for those bills generated that content. Don't be angry with the messenger. Thank you. Thank you. I, I sincerely want to thank both of you for joining us this evening. I think it's been a wonderful learning experience to hear how you feel on various sub subjects. I do encourage everybody, again, to go to Vote 411. You'll see your actual ballot and who you'll be voting for. And obviously, to vote next Tuesday, November the 6th, the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Thank you, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.